So, uh, welcome everybody to this session, which is called Live Hacking Smart Contracts. Um, we, we're not actually going to do like DevCon style hacking into live systems. Uh, what we hope to do is to have a kind of interactive session with the audience. Uh, where we discuss security, that's one thing, discuss it from like a high level perspective and meanwhile also trying to actually find bugs in the nitty gritty details of the contract. Uh, there will be technical glitches, uh, we will have to switch over the viewport from different laptops and stuff, I hope you'll uh, have some patience with that. Uh, first of all, I'm Martin Holzwende. I work for the Ethereum Foundation uh, with security, Ethereum security, and also get development uh, with me. We've got uh, Matthew DiFerrante here, mm -hmm. founder of uh, CK Labs, uh, smart contract auditing and... Yeah, crypto research and stuff. And we got Richard Moore, Hello. Authors, uh, author of uh, Ethers, JS and also I know does random stuff <laughs> random stuff <laughs> and we were just joined by the awesome Nick Johnson Ooh. who came right from a uh, ENS AMA um, so the idea is that we uh, take a piece of code which someone here submits and we discuss it and if possible, we would be very grateful if uh, that someone is willing to come up on stage and uh, chat with us for a bit and talk about the contract. Um, and as far as I know, we've received one submission so far over Twitter. Uh, so is Mr. Appleton present and would he like to uh, join us? In guess, the room? I guess they're not here. Because they're not here. Um, that's a bit unfortunate because one of the things, like from a security perspective, that it's good to do is get a general high level understanding what does this contract do? And uh, what are the assets? So we kind of have a bounce on what can be lost and what would be like the worst case to happen and uh, get an idea on what to look out for. Uh, since this particular contract was submitted yesterday, I think all, all four of us have probably taken at least a peek on it. Mm -hmm. Does anyone of you guys want to have seen something interesting? Should we go from top to bottom, or say what we what we think about this? So it's a token contract, uh, which to most appearances is, is quite normal. It has uh, an owner. Um, there's a transfer. And this is uh, actually a pattern here which I'd like to raise as a, a good example, which I call the uh, double dispatch uh, ownership. No, sorry, it doesn't have that. It has a single <laughs> dispatch. Uh, so when you transfer ownership of this thing to someone else, it has a check to see that you don't actually transfer it to no owner. Uh, and then it just sets the owner to the new owner. There's another way to do this. Uh, the double dispatch is that you set, uh, you don't set the owner to new owner, you set the potential new owner to the new owner. And then the actual new owner needs to make a call to accept the ownership. Uh, that means that you know for a fact that the owner of the contract is capable of making Ethereum messages and interacting with contracts. Then we have the ERC-20 implementation. And we have safe map. So, uh, anything, yeah, nothing really to mention about the safe math as kind of standard. 
Although it might be worth noting when you're looking at somebody else's contract, you might want to check to make sure the safe Mac was, co was copied over and they aren't hiding bugs in that. Because mm. yeah. you might just mm. gloss over it and be like, oh, I trust it. And then, because that. Yeah. Kindness. I think I feel like that, that's one thing that uh, is like, would be really helpful to have like compi compiler level support for like import the code that has this hash. Right. Right. Because oftentimes, like, yeah, it, it's very easy to just assume this is this is fine. It looks like it's from Zeppelin or ENS yeah. name, maybe, so that you can yeah. import safemath.eth as opposed to, because then you can just e as easily lie about the hash. It's well, it you can't like you a can't. bunch of random. I mean, if if the tool grabs like something based on the hash, like oh, I'm thinking, like if I'm looking at EtherScan, I see like import some crazy hash. Oh, I'm right, going to yeah. trust that this is safe math and not some sort of. Oh yeah. But okay. if it says safemath.eth, I have more faith that it's like. So I think. Uh, ETHPM is trying to, to accomplish this sort of thing. And with some compiler integration, that would be a good starting point. Right. So um, here's the ERC20 implementation of the specification. And so I'd like to ask you guys, and, and to give some context, the ERC20 specification states that the transfer method should return a Boolean whether the transfer was successful or not. And as you can see, and this is quite common to see, that it actually never returns false. It either returns true or it throws. So what, what was your guys' opinion? Would you oh. make a note of this in, in the audit? Do you recommend against it or for it? I would definitely make note. Like the problem is something, another contract might be calling this to do something and now you've called, caused that contract to fail as a result of, you know, it's supposed to return false if it didn't work as opposed to bail out of the universe. I'm of the opposite opinion. Uh, ERC20 was broken when it said that you should return false and not revert state changes if you try and do something illegal and uh, tried to fight to get people to actually revert uh, when you know illegal changes are made because it's far too, uh, far too error prone to try and handle things with an undo mechanism yourself uh, rather than relying on the VM's mechanism. And if the if it's hard to handle a return, uh, a revert in Solidity, then it's a problem with Solidity that we should fix. Well, I think it's also just, um, it's probably better for the next, at least the next year or two to just use the throw pattern, just because you, you I don't think you literally wouldn't have enough gas for non-trivial contracts to do try accepted locks, mm. right? Like the amount of checking, I mean, like it, it's, it's already a nightmare to do try accepted locks in, in normal software, if you're trying to do with all the constraints of the blockchain and, and well, of, of the EVM and, and the, like, the amount of stuff Solidity doesn't support out of the box, is, is I think the amount of errors will go up a lot. And I think, yeah, the ERC-20 standard was a bit messy because, I mean, like, this can only ever return true, right? I mean, this is never going to return false. Most contracts do that. Um, so, like, wh why even have a Boolean at all? Well, the original idea was that it shouldn't ever throw. It should return false if you tried to transfer more tokens than you had, for instance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's broken. Yeah, but. I feel like I've been overthrown, but I mean, that's <laughs> my, my, my argument is even if the specific specification kind of sucks, we should still follow the specification and make an ERC-20 plus something that says don't do dumb things. Oh, so, like, so to be fair, I don't think this is non-compliant because the ERC-20 doesn't say anything about mm, whether you can throw or not. Right. Uh, if you return... Uh, successfully, you have to return true, um, but throwing in a case of a failure isn't prohibited. That's fair. And then, like on 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 the this is this is like a real or has been a real bad problem in the compiler where um, it's not strict enough. Like you could, for example, write at, at least up until very recently, you could write this function without ever returning true, right? So like right. take mm -hmm. away that return true, and it would still like it would just put a zero on the stack, basically, right? Silently return yeah. false. Return false. <laughs> and then between compiler version 4.22 and 4.23, uh, like a bug was fixed with the call data return, um, where I guess like it was made more strict. So now those contracts actually return zero in, in, on the mm. require. Yeah, so the output area is cleared before the call is made. Right. Yeah. And yeah, earlier, and the output area was the, the input already resided there. Yeah. And because so this because the compiler was too lenient, and now like. Within, if you compile a checking contract that requires wraps a require around the token transfer and the transfer goes through okay, but it returns zero now, like it properly allocates that zero, then the uh, like the contract will throw even though it's actually gone through correctly. I don't quite get that, but I'll bug you afterwards to get those <laughs> sure. details. Uh, another thing <laughs> worth mentioning here is the uh, 
one, lines 123 and 124, I think. I can't quite make out the alignment. Uh, 124 and 125 are redundant. Um, if, if the, sorry, 124 isn't. Uh, the check that the value is less than the balances is also enforced by safe math. It depends on the version of safe math you're using. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. For Fair the enough. for the room to hear. So the comment was that the safe math uh, fails on revert. Uh, assert. Assert. Right. And. Yeah. In this version. <laughs> and it, it's a good question. Like it's it's kind of a philosophy question. Um, are you using safe math because you believe it should like. Um, throw in the case of an um, a honest mistake, like the idea that if, sa if a safe math method ever fails, it represents an, an error in the contract, or are you doing it because you want it to automatically catch uh, overflows for you? Uh, and, and one philosophy leads to reverse and the other to assert. So the comment from the audience is that we remove the, um, the safe math check on line 120. Eight, and instead do a regular minus. Yeah, so these are basically the same check. And well, the the one on one twenty nine checks against overflow, so one twenty eight could succeed. And yeah. So and one one important stuff to see that they got right here in this section is that you do the subtraction and addition in the right order, so that you don't like I want to transfer. 10 tokens from myself to myself, and then you add it to yourself, and then you uh, can do it kind yeah. of wrong, so you get the double amount. If you, if you do it the other way around, and you have zero tokens, you can still transfer a million tokens to yourself. Mm. All right, uh, let's move on. If, if, if there's any submissions coming in while we're talking, um, yeah, keep them coming, keep them coming. So it's uh, it's not a, a necessarily a security issue, but it is a, a events issue. If you add to the balance before you subtract, and you start off with a zero balance, and you're transferring to yourself, then you add a million tokens to your balance, and then you subtract a million tokens from your balance, and that succeeds, and it emits an event saying you sent yourself a million tokens, uh, which shouldn't be possible. But the, wasn't there also a case of one of these tokens where you could uh, increase your own balance. Uh, yes. uh, so the bad consequence would be that uh, it could be a little fake overflow if you first increase the balance and you, if you're transferring from you, to yourself then you effectively will double your balance and this can overflow uh, even though that uh, this is impossible because the total number of tokens is less than maximum allowed value. But I wanted to comment about the safe math implementation actually. It has uh, some uh, bad style there, I mean this one implementation on top, because uh, it allows overflow actually to uh, uh, to happen, and then try to detect it afterwards. No, not this, but the implementation of yeah, the implementation. Uh, safe math, right? Because it's uh, heavily relies on the particular behavior of overflow. Which particular one are you talking about? Uh, for example, this one multiple multiplication, right? So it first allows uh, uh, overflow to happen at line 58, right? and then tries to detect it afterwards, uh, heavily relying on uh, what exact result. So it's obvious that if overflow didn't happen, that uh, at line 59, everything will be fine. But the opposite is not obvious. I mean, it's uh, hard to prove that uh, if overflow actually happened, then condition at 59 will be uh, violated. It's not that easy to understand. And you, know, you need to know the particular behavior of how overflow works. I mean, what exact result will overflow return? Right? So it's better to check before uh, doing actual multiplication to check uh, that uh, it's easy, easy, easy check. Uh, I mean, you need to define max allowed value by one argument and compare to another. Yeah. <clears throat> right? And the same problem, I think, with uh, addition. But not with subtraction. Subtraction is okay, but addition. Is this, is this um, pra like from a practical point of view? No, actually, the overflow behavior is predictable, at least in yeah. EVM. But it's not that predictable in Solidity, 
right? Because, for example, the division by zero behavior uh, already changed in solidity while it doesn't change in EVM, right? And so we can't uh, guarantee that overflow behavior will not change in solidity in the future, despite right. that in EVM it will stay the same. But here we uh, rely on the particular overflow behavior uh, instead of preventing overflow at all. Right? And so in terms of gas cost, it will be the same. I mean, preventing overflow or detecting it afterwards. Okay. So I wanted to point out something uh, that transfer from isn't doing, which is the what I consider at least the anti-pattern of requiring, sorry, not transfer from, uh, approve, of requiring someone to set their approvals to zero before they can set them to another value. Mm -hmm. uh, that was mooted in, in result for, of the, the issue with uh, sort of uh, front running with transaction approvals. Uh, and in my opinion, the the correct way to handle that is for end user clients to send a send an approval to set it to zero first, and then just to reset it, not for contracts to enforce it. Because so, could I just give some context on that? So it's basically if if Nick approves that I can use ten of his tokens, <clears throat> and then at some later point he says no, Martin, he should only be able to use spend five of them, and I see his approval is on the network for five tokens, so then I quickly grab the ten tokens and his approval comes in, and I can grab another five tokens, then I got 15, so that's. Yeah. And the, the correct way to handle that is either with uh, first setting the, the app, either first setting the approval to zero and then back, but not for the uh, token contract to enforce that, because there are, for instance, smart contracts that use the approvals mechanism. They're doing that atomically in a single transaction, so they're not vulnerable to this race condition, but they will nevertheless be broken by a token that does this, and possibly irre irrevocably broken. Yeah, I mean the the contract has increased approval and decreased approval, but then yes. it also has approve. I mean, yep. so it would have been great to just null out approve. <laughs> then it wouldn't be uh, C twenty, of course. Yeah, whatever. Uh, so this increased approval is that standardized in a way? Not really. Uh, it's a de facto standard. I think there's an audience question too. Oh. For example, if I have a malicious user and I see a transaction that reduces my approval to zero, so when I just transfer the, those ten tokens anyway. Yes, and nothing can stop you from doing that. Uh, it prevents, if, if it was 10 and I'm setting it to 5, then without this mitigation you could spend a total of 15, because you could spend the 10 and then I re-approve you for 5, and then you spend the 5. It also prevents you from the other direction. Even if you were approved for 10, I changed it to approve you for 20. In this scheme you could take a 30, right? Because you take that initial 10, and then when I bump it up to 20, you're actually able to take it. So it works in both directions. Yes. Right. So setting it to zero uh, and raising it again to five has to be two separate transactions. Uh, I think in response to the tweet was the the official yeah. submission venue. <laughs> yeah, we can probably post it somewhere afterwards as well. But I think he wants to know how he can get it, draw the draw a submission to our attention now. Oh, I see. Is there a submission somewhere in some queue? Yeah. Um, cool. There's a camp for the UFC 24 that I posted, but I posted wrong. I just tagged you guys. I didn't reply to the tweet. Right. Uh, We'll go through this a bit more um, until, because I think there were some, and then we'll jump to the next one. This is the actual contract implementation and not just boilerplate. Um, well, there is actually mostly boilerplate. In the constructor, it says issue cards for, what is that, from line 255. But there's 100 to, of them, I counted. There's 100 sure. of them. <laughs> <laughs> And every call to issue card here in this constructor will increase the total supply to 100 and set the balances of these hard-coded addresses. And then there's this, uh, and that's an internal thing, so no one can call that externally. And then we have the buy card. Uh, there was actually one quick thing I want to point out with the issue card. On this part they actually did write, oftentimes in the constructor people allocate tokens and don't call transfer which means that there's no transfer events. So if you are writing a tool that works against like status or one of those other um, apps that, that looks at the history to figure out how many tokens you have, if you were allocated five tokens, for example, in the constructor and it, a transfer never happened, 
and you're just looking for those events, you don't actually know that you had five tokens. So that I thought was. So that means in between function, function you should also go transform code. Right, from zero to whoever. Yeah, yeah. and, and I, it's also good to, it's also good like a reminder that the transfer event is like merely a helper, right? So a lot of a lot right. of apps like just kind of assume the transfer event is the absolute truth, but it, but it's good to al always at least check on chain whether that transfer event were, you know like represents reality. Right. And one other quick comment I might make um, as a shameless plug is there's a system called Merkle Airdrops that might have worked better here. Um, Oh, yeah. For 100, maybe not so bad, but you can imagine you don't want to, if you're putting this out into 1,000 people's hands, um, not everyone maybe use their card. It makes more sense to you to Merkleize it and just submit the Merkle hash and then force people to claim it. If that works in your case, it might not work in all cases, but I could imagine situations where deploying this, especially if you want to issue 10 million cards, would be infeasible. Or a couple more audience yes. questions. What is uh, this? Sorry, I just use the microphone because I still has it. Uh, I think that issue card has a bug here because it can lead to inconsistent total supply. Because if you issue card uh, to the same address twice, uh, then uh, the balance will be still uh, one, but total supply will be increased twice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Since since addresses are hard coded, this can be discovered at the you know uh, at the code at the this stage where we're at. But okay. you're totally right that I mean, in itself, yes, that is flawed. You also bring up another good point. If I was doing this, I would probably sort the cards so mm -hmm. by inspection you could tell yeah. easier if there was a duplicate one. Yeah, I think this is a good. Uh, this is I think regardless. I would change this because this is an example of like very fragile code. If the guy decides, oh, actually, I don't have a, like you know hard coded list. I might I need I want it to be dynamic, and then he changes this, and then he forgets to say, oh, issue card wasn't made for that, and he'll deploy that, and then that you know like somebody buys something once, and then he'll lose like you know he'll lose one of them, right? Um, so yeah, it's like always. You know, it doesn't really cost. You know, would probably end up being like five more opcodes, but it's it's good. <laughs> yeah, it would, it would be like a balance is two dot uh, and then plus. Right? Yeah. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. So, like so always always good to, guess. to try to make your code as anti fragile as possible, just because it's it works. If it's work, if it's wonky, but it works in this specific situation, just change it so that it works in the general case, because you'll forget to change it later on. Having been a security auditor in like uh, general IT security, one thing that I've learned is that uh, ask a lot of stupid questions and don't be afraid <laughs> to look stupid because it makes things go faster if you just spit out things you don't understand. And I actually don't understand really how buy card works because here money comes in and checks some stuff and it emits an event, yeah, someone bought a card uh, and that then sends the money off, out to somewhere else doesn't actually make any storage changes about who owns the cards. Uh, so there's no like... I have a little external context on this. Yes. Uh, the please. author of this contract is present at DevCon and is selling physical cards. If you transfer one Ether using the buy card function with a hash and then you provide him in person with the pre-image, he will give you the physical card. Right, so it's a one-off mm. purchase physically that you get the yep. card and... Right, so that's where there's no actual state change, meaningful state change in the buy card function, sorry. So uh, along the question of asking questions that may be, uh, you know, silly, but uh, use of a pre-image for securing an asset means that you may be front run because it's a symmetric secret, meaning that if you observe someone attempting to claim this and you're not modifying the state of the actual contract, someone else can observe the fact that you've admitted that transaction and attempt to perform the same action to claim the card. Yep. Uh, so that would be a concern. Well, in actually, this. In, in this specific case, all you would be doing is just like paying for someone else's card, right? Because um, I think like the, the, the data isn't exactly a, a secret. Like it's not meant to be a secret, right? Well, it's a hash of a secret. Right, um, so I mean, if you submit somebody else's hash of a secret, then you just wouldn't be able to reveal it in person. Yes, and if you're talking about front-running the reveal, then in this case, this is an in-person reveal, so you would have to literally jump oh. in front of them and shout the secret. <laughs> I misunderstood the, the intent then, but yes. Um, um, but yeah, it's a good point Like about ha commit and reveal schemes in general. You, if you, um, you need either the commit needs to contain some data that makes it possible, impossible for someone else to front-run it, such as the target address, 
or you need to use something other than just a simple hash reveal, like using a, a key pair. So quick question. I didn't realize the context of this contract, but you just mentioned that. How, is, how does the owner actually issue the card to the person? He hands it to them in person. I mean, but in the contract, or, or uh, they don't. They're buying a physical object. Each of these each of these cards he's handing out has a key pair on it, and each of those cards is listed in the contract here and owns uh, one token. And then he will physically give you the physical card, and you will now own the key pair that owns the token. What is this token actually uh, used for? Okay. So, uh, representing that you have a card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it does seem misused to me. That's okay, so, but uh, yeah. that means all cards are fungible? Uh, yeah, uh, it, but yeah, it should that's, probably, that's, they should probably be NFTs. Instead. Yeah, that's a weird, like... Card correctness is yeah. <laughs> all cards are the same basically. I just like to mention one um, one more thing on this contract before we can move on to the next. And if one of you guys can start bringing up the next contract, uh, so we can switch over to that. Uh, this I think is very good to have an emergency drain on a contract uh, because you never know what people are going to send to it. Um, so even if you don't expect. I mean, you can prevent getting ether, but you can't prevent getting tokens. So if the tokens wind up there, it's nice if the owner can ship them off somewhere else. And I think this kind of also nicely demonstrates uh, a minor pet peeve that I have with Solidity. <laughs> and it is that owner, in this case, is an address. And doing the owner.transfer actually means doing a call with uh, next to no gas which cannot, is not vulnerable to re-entrancy. And the transfer also protects it. If, it. if it fails, it will throw. Whereas in this style, mm -hmm. where it's an ERC-20 interface, and this looks oddly similar. I mean, it's a something dot transfer, but actually this is a full-blown call with all available gas and totally different semantics. It also has a return value, which you might or might not read out. Um, and as an auditor, it's when you're doing a manual audit, you have to be really careful about all these things. Is this an address, or is this a, an address in the geese of an of an interface, and actually a full-blown call? Um, that's that's kind of a thing that you can trip on. Are they? Are wasn't there like a like a, a talk of deprecating that, or or no? Are we? It's I'm not familiar new, with that. Basically, what? Zero point five the base address table for transfer as a normal address will not transfer on the same table anymore. Okay. So, uh, transfer was a recent introduction to the address object. Is there? Yes. How will you transfer to an address in future? Oh, I see. Okay, so for anyone that didn't hear, there will be a new data type payable address which you can cast an address to, and it only has that method if it's a payable type. Sorry? Ex exp uh, so the comment is that you have to make it explicit in the constructor for that to happen. But uh, what do you mean in the constructor of what? If you have an address as an object, If you have, if you call that me call the method within, like a function, and the function itself does not have payable, it won't be registered. Like it won't allow that to actually happen. No, you can you can always send funds out from a non-payable function. Uh, we're talking here about whether you can send calling the transfer method on an address, and apparently in future there will be an address subtype, and only that will have the transfer function to. Right. Right. So, so this is uh, I don't know the right terminology. Maybe it's a keyword, but it's like oddly. So in this case, it's a key. It's a synthetic thing which has been added syntactic sugar on the address type, and this type is a method with an actual concrete method called transfer on an external account, and. For security, there are very different semantics, and they matter a lot. Yeah. 
so I've, I've had a couple of people send me uh, things in tweet DMs. I only have my phone here, so please send them to, to other people as well. Yeah, it, while, I, while I set this up, you just describe what the contract does, if you could. Yeah, so hi, everybody. My name is Brennan. Um, we've created a work contract. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've created a work contract so that you can deposit tokens in it and then be eligible to be selected to complete work. So you say deposit 1,000 tokens, and then now you can uh, start working in some capacity. Um, so it's still a work in progress, so I think it's going to get shredded. Um, but the idea is that you, you deposit a certain amount of tokens, and then the work manager is able to withdraw um, from that deposit for jobs. And as soon as that um, uh, deposit drops below the uh, size of the jobs requirement, like the stake, then you'll become suspended. And so you ha that forces you to deposit back into the contract to refill your, your work tokens. So if you can imagine, it's like the work deposit is sort of that is the number of jobs you can have on the fly, if you will. Um, so, so there's a few things that we haven't implemented, like uh, being able to withdraw, but, um, or sorry, have a, having a, a restriction on the timer, but I'm not sure if it's absolutely necessary, so I guess I'll hand it off to you guys to, to have a look. So, um so is there is there a native new token or are there like um, it's I've actually left that out. It's just ERC twenty, um, so you can just you know uh, instantiate. So, we, so, so okay. So will will this thing be dealing with assets of value such as ether or whatever valuable token? Just a custom work token. Just a custom work token. Yeah. So at this point, is there anything? You know, what what are the assets? Are there any assets that are have a value? Um, no, just the inherent value of being part of the work contract so you can participate in the jobs. Mm -hmm. So that the value exchange is outside of that. And you become eligible to take part <sighs> in that value network by staking tokens in the work contract. So, All right. Yeah, and, and who are the different actors in this model? So you have someone who does work. Yes. So you've got the worker who stakes the initial deposit. You have the uh, job manager who is responsible for pulling out the, uh, the, the job deposit, if you will, which is going to be smaller than the initial deposit. And then, of course, you have the owner of the contract who can deploy. And the owner of the contract is this, can he do administrative, administrative stuff on the contract? Mm -hmm. Like what? Uh, if I recall, it was a couple of weeks ago, I believe it's just instantiating it, and then there might be... They can set the stake limit, for example. Right, right, yeah. There's a few public variables um, that, you can, that you can adjust. So hopefully it's small enough for you guys to grok. Okay. So, let's see. Um, what, where would a user... What would, what would be the first action a user does? Let's start so you, from you deposit goal. stake. Okay, so let's go. Uh, it's quite hard for a lot. I have to <laughs> look at two different things. Uh, so the owner is just like an admin that manages this. Okay. Okay, so. Ah, oh, fuck. Okay, so the owner deposits their stake. Um, and it seems like they get tokens deposited, I mean, sent back to them, right? Yeah, and just to add, add to this, um, so the, um, the worker has to approve the, uh, the transfer before this deposit stake is called. So one thing I noticed in the deposit stake is it doesn't seem to care whether it actually succeeds, like token.transfer from, um, you might have the allowance, but you can yes. imagine there could be other restrictions, like can't send to a contract address or something weird like it's a or you might just not have enough tokens <laughs> right absolutely so, so yes, here, right. here's one of these cases where <laughs> well, we have this not. ambiguity right uh, where if this token is actually an implementation of the ERC 20 specification which conforms exactly to the letter of the specification and this transfer from fails and returns a false uh, we just don't care about that yeah so it's a, it's a case of being uh, liberal with what you accept and, and careful with what you omit. Uh, if you call transfer, you should always wrap that in a require. Right. Yep. 
yeah, the, the check for the allowance isn't necessary because the transfer call will fail if you don't have an allowance. Okay. Uh, and in this case, the, the check for the allowance is actually a call out to another contract, so there's a minimum of 700 gas um, plus trans state reading fees. Right. Yep. So, yeah, always wrap your important stuff in your cars. Which, um, uh, again, is the sort of thing you're talking about because transfer and solidity is explicitly doesn't require you wrap it and require. <laughs> <laughs> but then, yeah, so it's quite confusing. Yeah. Um, also, one thing here, so going to the, since, since that deposit stake uh, calls the deposit function, um, if you're going to use, if you're going to import safe math and use it in some places, best to use it everywhere consistently, um, at least in my opinion, because otherwise it's, if you get used to seeing mixed code, uh, you know, mixed some safe math and sometimes otherwise not, it'll, it's also too, become, going to become too easy for you to look at a line that needs safe math and then just ignore it because you're just used to, you know, like the cognitive overload of like keeping track of what, which threshold am I using safe math on, you know, it's, it can easily get mix, mixed up. <clears throat> um, as a more generic thing I want to point out as well, like a lot of auditing is just kind of getting your head wrapped around what the contract's trying to do in the first place. Um, yeah. Going back to the description, like it's uh Yeah, that's kind of why, why being a, an effective auditor uh, ties well together with not being afraid to ask stupid questions. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, oftentimes like the, the biggest vulnerabilities are the ones that are most obvious or the ones where like you, you know, you're reading the code and it kind of, it's structured in a way to make you believe something um, what that isn't actually true. Uh, and so, you know, like when you get that inclination to be like, oh, should be really this, should we, should this really be this, this way? It's important to like, you know, voice those concerns and actually act on them as opposed to being, oh, I'm sure that's fine. Nobody would get that wrong. <laughs> you know, like, you know, we've seen some pretty, pretty drastic um, outcomes based on, you know, that kind of <laughs> right. uh, mindset. And two lines being flipped. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the error messages are like the other way around. So it should say stake is over the limit, not stake is below the limit, because that's what it throws when, when it fails. So my partner agrees with you. I like to express what the Boolean is. So you're... But that's, I feel like, a philosophy. No, no, no. This is an error message that will be thrown, right? He's, so he's... it should t tell what, what, what went wrong. But he's stating Not what, what condition what was right. violated. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I agree with you, but I can see the, the other uh, side okay, at least. Okay. Because you can imagine the output would say fail and then explain what uh, was supposed to happen. It's, I, this is a question going back maybe like one or two steps when we were talking about uh, wrapping the transfer function in a require. Is that like a general good practice for when you're making a call out to another um, contract function that you should wrap it in a require? If you don't have some other mechanism to check to be sure that it succeeded, yeah. So like, I, I yeah. I mean, that's a good question. So like, definitely don't take from this that you should all. Anytime you're always calling out, you should always wrap it in a car because that in itself can create vulnerabilities, right? Like, if there's a contract, for example, that iterates over a bunch of addresses and it wants to give a payout to each of those addresses, right? If one of those addresses is a smart contract that's malicious, it can just throw the moment you th you give something it and then. You, you send something to it, and then all the other payouts are stuck because of my malicious contract. Mm -hmm. And I could black melee with that, saying, "Now you're gonna, you're all gonna send me one ether. Otherwise, I'm blo gonna block your two ether payout forever." Right? So you should always, you should, first, first of all, try not to do that loop contract, which is bad. But besides that, um, you should, uh, you should wrap things around requires if and only if uh, uh, that line failing is just. Cr critical damage to your contract, right? If it, if like, if this line fails, then nothing should happen, right? Otherwise, try to catch the return, right? If there is a return, you need to be very context aware. Um, yeah, uh, it looks like Martin has something. To no, say. yeah. So I think isn't there a, an overflow here on, on uh, in deposit, say which again? is an in, internal function, but an overflow uh, because the balance, the amount is u into fifty six which arrives from a couple of lines above. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, addition there uh, without overflow checking. It will overflow. The new balance will be below the stake limits. Or, well, not necessarily. 
So, or maybe necessarily. From from a quick look through, I think all the places deposit are called the amount is set by the smart contract, so it can ensure, um, you know, that plus total supply is not an overflow. But it's it speaks to talking about making anti fragile code where you should add these checks even if you don't think they can happen. It also right. makes the code more readable. Even if it's going to be guaranteed, it's nice from a readability point of view. Could you just scroll up a bit so we see where it's called, the deposit? Uh, so there's one at deposit job stake as well. Yeah. It's called so a few times. Here. So that calls deposit, but required stake there comes from a public a state variable right. of the contract. And I guess that's the only one there as well. It was required. Yeah, several, from here. several calls to it, but in each All case, right. I think it comes from a state variable. Yeah, so, but I, and yeah, I think. So given the context, it's fine, but it's not robust. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's also, this is a, also another good point. I I always sort of suggest that if you have multiple functions, right, calling a lower level function or like an internal function, and there's some. A security issue that could arise if those wrapping functions do not do a, perform a certain action. In this case, making sure that the allowance is be, within a certain value, then you should absolutely move uh, the check or the constraint to the f shared function, right? So, in here, for example, like you know, by by uh, by work. Wait, by you know, putting safe math here, uh, you you. Uh, take away an overflow of vulnerability from any function that uses this function. And so mm -hmm. the people, you know, when, when you're extending in the future, when people are building against your API, they don't have to have the cognitive overhead of, or, oh, this function is vulnerable to overflows, right? So if there's, if there's a mitigation that you can build in, that's, you know, the, where there's an issue that's uh, suffer, that multiple functions may suffer, always put that uh, mitigation in the most deep function call. Um, another question, there's a function there, select worker. I assume the goal is that that gets called off-chain? Uh, the select worker function, uh, does that get called off-chain? Uh, no, it does get called on-chain by something else that supplies the entropy. Okay, by a, another smart contract then? Uh, essentially the job manager. Right. Um, one thing to bear in mind there is you may not be selecting uniformly at random because if your range, the range of your random values yeah. isn't a modulo of the, the size. So probably a better approach would be to expose the number of stakers and expose a way to index the stakers and then let the caller figure out how to uh, select uniformly at random because this hides the fact that it's doing modulo and you think it's just, you know, magically gets an even distribution. If you Google modulo bias, you'll find a nice, concise way to take the max minus the modulo minus the size. Da, da, da. It's like a little more complicated, but you you defeat modulo bias. And of course, if you're doing the checks on chain, uh, doing the, the pseudo random generation on chain, then all the usual caveats about yes. uh, you know random numbers on chain yeah. apply. And and all, yeah, and then this is also vulnerable to front running if you can. Uh, you know, increase the length of mm -hmm. the stakers before that select worker gets a called. Yeah, so right? if, you're, if you're off by one from being chosen, you yeah. could, yeah. Uh, so I have a question. Will you be using some KYC system for the workers? Oh, I think that's kind of outside the scope of the issue, right? I mean, okay, uh, it, it, it depends because if you won't, the stake limit uh, does nothing. It's, it's not... Uh, like the stake limit, you know, uh, to limit the maximum stake, so maximum uh, chance of each worker can be get uh, like uh, bypassed by just registering with multiple addresses inside the stake limit. So it's not civil resistant without a KYC system, right? It's funny, we actually explored that because we were considering um, letting people uh, have a lot of stake and then weight the workers proportionally according to how much stake they have. But computationally, that's, a, that's, not, that's very challenging because basically this is O1 for all the operations and at best it'd be ON depending on how you want to balance read optimization versus write optimization. So we decided that KYC be damned, I guess. We just <laughs> let them, if they have a million, they can stake that many addresses. So, but it's, but again, I think it's kind of outside the scope of this. It depends on how you want to use it. But you, you bring up an excellent point, I think. I 
I mean, the stake limit, so the question was, wouldn't it be better to get rid of the stake limit then so you can stake as much as you want? And that's still an unopened question that we've been talking about because really, if you can just only do one job at a time, then really you only need like the job stake amount minimum. Yeah, and I think it's something to keep in mind in general when you're doing these sorts of things is to keep in mind because that's definitely an issue. Like when people can be, mul when many people could actually be one actor, um, and this is a pattern we do see a lot is people just trusting, no, no, one address means one person. But like you said, if, if you have a million addresses and there's only two other workers, you have a one million out of a million and two chance of being picked for this thing. So. Um. All right, uh, should we, uh, so we got uh, one tiny submission that we could, we could take a look at that. Uh, we have like 10 minutes left. Uh, alternatively, we could just uh, um, talk about our favorite pet peeves or whatever. <laughs> Thanks guys, by the way. Thanks guys. Yeah, no thank you for uh, coming on stage. Yeah. Here you go. Yeah, so this is uh, pretty small, pretty straightforward, and uh, I wanted to kind of kick off the discussion. I mean, I think all of you will immediately see what I'm getting at. Um, uh, line 21. Uh, so, um, I, I mean, given that there was some changes in, in the new Open Zeppelin version 2 and so on in this uh, direction, I wanted to kind of kick off the discussion towards re-entrancy protections and so on, and what all you guys uh, think about that, given that you were also partially involved with that and so on. Yeah, so I think uh, the first thing is that this contract is, you know, like, just generally, stop doing this, you know, <laughs> don't check if things are contracts. There is no way to, there is no way to do this on Ethereum that's foolproof. Um, there is. No. No, no, no. Uh, so, oh, well, actually, well, you, you can prove that it's not a contract by checking that the message of sender equals origin. Sure. But you cannot prove that it is a contract. Like one of the big issues is counterfactual. Yeah. I can compute the address a contract will live at, and now I can use that, but in the future it becomes a contract. So. <laughs> right, if the TX origin is equal, yes. And, but I think in general, it's it's. I think it's an anti-pattern because we want to build a system that is interoperable and if you can't build a secure contract unless it's being called by an externally owned account, then you need to rework your contract so it is. And and, um, right, and, and it, this one as, broken, as for anyway. the mechanics of this, uh, Nick, you want to? Yeah, so uh, if you call self-destruct, uh, the contract's code uh, size will be zero even though the contract is still callable for the rest of the transaction. So you could exploit this by having your contract self-destruct itself and then call this and then do re-entrancy and then die afterwards. No, hold on. No, 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 no. Am I? No, the Xcode size will not be zero. Am uh, I getting it back until the end of the... Yeah. The, the Xcode size will still be the actual code size until after the... But the constructor, that's it. Yeah. Because the construct during the constructor, the yes, code, you're right, then sorry. the Xcode yes. size of that address will be zero. And yeah. I would still not, I don't know, the, the TX origin thing doesn't make, it's not a comfortable assumption for me long term. Because like, for example, what if uh, we have TX abstraction in the future, right? Like the, you know, things coming from the unsigned address that there may be actually be code there because it may count the, st depending on how it's implemented in the future, it may count the stub as code. There is actually, I think, maybe only one foolproof, future proof way to do this, which is, check the a hash of message sender against a, a signature of message from that address, right? Because mm -hmm. smart contracts, obviously anything that is a public contract can't have a private key. Um, so if you, if you make sure that the, you get a signature from whoever is calling, um, then that's, that's like a, I, I would assume a foolproof way. Probably. Yeah. Who knows what well, crazy moon math we'll have in the future. We'll see, like yeah. it's a... Uh, that's really important. You can also just check the extra free size on <laughs> I mean, I think in this particular case, it might not actually be exploitable because it then relies on calling the thing it asserted wasn't a contract. So if it's still in the constructor, it has no code and you can't call it back yet. But oh, right. uh, again, Nick, I'd Nick, still could say you, could, you, could, you, could you explain? I didn't, I didn't uh, catch that. So what, oh. what was the idea? Mm. No, mm. but it, <laughs> uh. Anyway, the idea is that uh, you have a, a two-step process for contracts where the first the 
the first transaction they call in and they set up a lien or something like that, and then in a separate block they call again if you check external quit size on the second block, second transaction, and it's not zero. Yeah, in, in this case, if message sender has no code, it still works because it's just a rally transfer. Yes, but it can't be exploited for re-entrancy, which I assume is what the author was worried about. I, I do have one quick question, actually. Can you set the init code to be empty so you can actually have a contract with no code? Yes, you can okay. You can just literally return zero bytes. Yeah. Great. So that idea, um, by the way, with uh, that depends on that the idea that for... A transaction, a later transaction, the cannot have a zero code size again because the constructor will not be run again. And if it's in a different block, if it's in a different block, and that is true uh, for about another month. <laughs> <laughs> but then we have create two uh, coming, Ooh, which kind of changes the semantics and the the pattern of contract creation a bit, so that. And it will have quite an impact on security, uh, on the security aspects of how you deal with external contracts and assumptions that you can make because uh, it will be possible to take down a contract and replace it with something completely different on the same address uh, through the use of uh, loading the actual body code from an oracle on chain. In the constructor, oh, because actually, the address is determined from the in, from the init code yeah. and not from the actual runtime bytecode. Uh, and actually, I take back what I said before. Um, a smart contract. There is technically an extremely statistically unlikely possibility that you can create a smart contract address that you have a private key to. There's collisions in the in the namespace. But it's it, Meteor simultaneously has every Ethereum practitioner in the world unlikely. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you know, possible. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can I just follow up on that? Um, could you explain a little bit better? Is, is that within the realm of reason, a reasonable way to check if you have a smart contract calling you by requiring also a signature to be included? Yeah, I mean, it's it's it like getting that collision is like, you know, one in 10 billion universes. But please don't do it. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. But please, please don't do it, though, because it, it's systems are much more useful if they can be interacted with by other systems than if you try and enforce that they can only be interacted with by users. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that's what a, bit, uh, a bit what I meant. Like, for example, OpenZeppelin now has the re-entrancy guard, right? Mm -hmm. like, should it be used? Or are we kind of giving up on security because we are using the re-entrancy guard and admitting that we are incapable of reality? We are writing, like, re-entrancy safe code. Well, is, I think... Is the re-entrancy guard structured like this, where it can only be called by external code? No, it's uh, it's with uh, counters. So. Yep. So I would call uh, like a mutex, like a, a last, a, like a last resort. It's better than this, but it's still like you should be able to write your code without mutexes. Um, if you really can't, then actually mutexes will get more efficient in the next hard fork because of net gas metering. Oh yeah. Yeah, but be careful. What? Yeah, everyone read up on uh, Create2 because that's going to break a lot of assumptions, you guys. <laughs> it's yeah, also open really up a awesome. lot of opportunities as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there are like only a couple of minutes and the next team uh, are back to back. Yep. So we, I don't know, we can have like uh, one more question or so. Uh, so yes. why wouldn't this contract be vulnerable to re-entry? Couldn't I just... Um, Call deposit and send in the constructor of a contract. Uh, yes, but if you call send, then it will try and call you back, and because it's in the constructor, you don't yet have any code at that address, so it won't be able to be re-entrant. Yeah, the code, the way that Ethereum works is that the constructor returns a string of EVM bytes, and only at the end of the transaction are those okay, connected to the contract. Thanks. Do we have time for one more? Uh, what, what's the best way to, um, with transferring some value, uh, to set the gas limit? The easiest way is to use dot transfer, which sets it to the minimum, which is 20, is it 2100 or 2300? If we want to choose the limit uh, and yeah. not have the 21,000. In Solidity, you can do uh, function name dot gas in brackets and then second set of parentheses for the function arguments. But the thing is, okay. even if you do, if you provide zero, there is always the 2300 gas 
Right. The statement. Only for value Only sending transactions. If you, have, if you have a value. Yeah. Uh, you have to send at least one way. Yeah. Uh, but generally, generally, it's friendly to send at least 2,300 gas, even if you don't have to, because that way they can log events, which means, you know, otherwise it can have no effect whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Good. I think that's all we have time for. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you, audience. <laughs> <laughs>